you know, when I was a little kid, I was already pretty excited about science, so I liked reading about sort of classic experiments in physics, Rutherford and you know, others. Um, and I think part of that was that my parents were always supplying me with really interesting reading material about basic science kinds of issues. Um, and then um, one fateful Thanksgiving, uh, an uncle from California showed up who turned out to be a, a ham radio operator. This is long before um, the internet existed and before uh, people, had everybody had a computer. Um, and so ways that people used to talk to each other was over ham radio. And you would build radio transmitters and receivers and you put your antenna up on the roof. And one dinner with this guy, and I was totally hooked, so I went out and got my ham license and convinced my parents to let me put an antenna on the roof and have all this stuff in my radio area in the basement. And so I played around with that for a number of years. <clears throat> and then in high school, um, I, I found that I really enjoyed math and chemistry and physics and did a lot of work in those areas. And finally even uh, had an opportunity after junior year um, to go to a sort of little summer techn technological pro uh, program at Northwestern University. I grew up in Chicago. Um, it's the same university my parents had gone to, so they were really excited about it. Uh, and that was really a lot of fun. And so then as, a, as an undergrad, I really was already in a sort of combined undergrad and medical program. I uh, loved the uh, opportunities to do biochemistry research uh, with a guy named Mike Check, who runs a huge uh, medical program at UMass Worcester now. Um, and so he and I would talk every day about fat cells, which is the area in which we were working. Um, and just the, that conversation made science really exciting for me. Mike would sit down and say, well, what kind of data did you get yesterday, Art? And I'd explain it to him. And he'd quietly sit there and he'd think of the next experiment that might reveal um, how um, these particular fat cells were working to generate heat for the animals. So so-called brown fat is like a is like in, in a fat pad behind the neck and, and rodents use it as like a generator of heat. Um, so that was just a, a major experience I think that was really catalyzing for me. Um, I finished medical school and I, I wasn't really sure what to do, but I thought, okay, um, I, I think I've got time to do a little bit of medical training. Let me see if I like that. And I sort of liked it, but after uh, a, a year and a half or so, I, I got really fascinated in the idea at that point in history of tumorigenesis mediated by viruses. That was a sort of dominant theme that people were studying. So one gene inside of a tumor virus could make a normal cell turn into a malignant cancer cell. And so the next thing you know, instead of all the pediatric papers piling up on my nightstand, it was being crushed under the weight of all these papers about virus-mediated malignant cell transformation. And so when I finished residency, I went to the Salk Institute in California and worked in a just amazing environment. I, it was just, I was just very lucky. Um, with, with people who were, at, it was the dawn of the DNA cloning age, who were interested in cloning pieces of these viruses that were so-called transforming genes. A single gene that could make a cell become a malignant cell. And it, it was just an amazing place because everybody was treated the same, whether you were completely new to science, and, you know, molecular science as I was, or whether you were Francis Crick, who was our next door neighbor over on one side. You know, co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, or Renato Del Becco, who just won a Nobel Prize for figuring out how cells are transformed by viruses, or Bob Holly, who had figured out essentially one aspect of how uh, information is transferred in the, in the cell and got a Nobel Prize for that work. But all these guys were just absolutely modest, wonderful people who were happy to talk to you about any problem that you, that you had on the plate. And so it was just a wonderful environment. But at the end of three years, I thought, gee, it looks like it's possible to clone human genes all of a sudden. And you know, my medical training had involved conditions that were heritable conditions, where genes were clearly involved. And I thought, wow, I think I'm going to go back to New Haven and try to solve one of these really horrible inherited conditions. And so I worked on an enzyme deficiency that kills kids on the second or third day of life. And they're born normally, and then they die of ammonia intoxication on the third day of life, typically. 
And so we isolated that gene and developed a DNA diagnosis and, and helped work on some new therapies for it. Uh, and so that sort of brings me to today's story, because subsequent to that, I went across the hall from where I'd been doing work uh, under um, the auspices of a really fine scientist, Leon Rosenberg, and started my own lab. And I had a pretty good idea <clears throat> what I wanted to do in that lab, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But along the way, an accident occurred in the form of an experiment we did, and that led to a 20-year story that has been just briefly referred to, and then I'll flush out for you. So um, uh, the title of my talk is Chaperonins. That's what we've studied for 20 years or so. Molecular origami machines. And um, I can definitely tell you I would have never predicted that we would stumble into something like this, but that's what happened. So I'm going to spend just a couple slides to give you background. Um, so what we're talking about here is basic information transfer in the cell. So you know that DNA contains all the information, the blueprint for life as we know it, and for all the, the things that make us what we are. Well, at the other end, beyond that blueprint, are the effectors, the things that actually do the work that make us what we are, that is encoded by the DNA. And those are called proteins. And they have to be, in particular, three-dimensional architectures folded up in order to do their work. So how do you get from DNA to protein? Well, this central information transfer pathway, sometimes called the central dogma, uh, that was, it was worked out by many people um, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and run on up to today, there are aspects being studied. But in the simplest form, the DNA contains regions where there are triplets of, of DNA. You know, there's AGCT as the, the four uh, sort of um, uh, designators to work with, the four bases. And so what DNA does is it gets copied by polymerase into what's called RNA, or messenger RNA. It has the message from the DNA, and it's an exact blueprint. So for example, you can see here that this blue line contains essentially a copy of what is the upper strand of this DNA. Okay, so that's an RNA copy. And that RNA copy contains triplets of the AGCT in whatever order, um, but in a particular order, that encodes uh, amino acids. So this is the transition from nucleic acid to protein. And that occurs on a machine called the ribosome that I won't really talk too much about. But um, Yale is famous for ribosomes because we have Tom Stites here who figured out the, the x-ray structure of a, a good chunk of the ribosome. I received a Nobel Prize for that work several years ago. Uh, but the ribosome converts essentially that information in this linear strand of nucleic acid bases to, it takes the triplets, and each triplet encodes one amino acid. So they're colored differently here to indicate that, that a sequence of amino acids is being produced. Okay, so that's like a strand of spaghetti that leaves the ribosome. So as a strand of spaghetti, it has no 3D structure. It's really sort of lacking the full information. The information comes after protein folding occurs. And that's really what we're going to talk about today, is how do you get from a strand of spaghetti to a folded structure that carries out a cellular function? So that function could be structural. Could be like your hair is made of protein structure. I'll show you that in the microscopic level in just a second. Or it could be an enzyme that carries out the chemistry. So in our bodies, there are tons of metabolic reactions going on all the time. They can't go on spontaneously. They have to be so-called catalyzed or sped up by the action of enzymes that, can, that do this chemistry. They carry out a chemical reaction. Or transporters, molecules that help uh, ions or other substances get into your cells from outside. Okay, what is the architecture of a protein? I really should explain that before we talk about protein folding in any detail. So, again, there's a string of amino acid building blocks. So, it could be anywhere from maybe 10 amino acids to thousands of amino acids in huge structural proteins, for example. 
that each block is any one of 20 different amino acids. So for each amino acid position in a protein, there's 20 different choices, basically. But the codon, or that triplet that's back there at the level of the DNA and the RNA, dictates which amino acid gets put onto the growing string. Okay, so with tens to thousands of amino acids, a, a typical protein is about 200 to 600 amino acids. Okay, so that, that, that's a sort of characteristic size protein. So in, in, in Dalton's, for those who are comfortable with it, it would be anywhere from maybe 15 kilodaltons on up to 50 to 60 kilodaltons. Okay, so each protein has a characteristic sequence of amino acids, and as a result of that, it has a characteristic three-dimensional folded structure. So, so that structure could be part of supporting a cell in some way, or it could be a, an enzyme that's floating around that has an active site that carries out a chemical reaction. Um, so the folded structure is the active form of the protein. Okay, and so here's a really simple protein made out of like a tinker toy. And so it has a, a sequence of amino acids. So these top guys are strands, and there's an arrow that indicates which way the strand is pointing. And this is like an anti-parallel strand, the one, one direction on the top and a different direction on the bottom. And then below that is what we would call an alpha helix. This is sort of symbolic, but I'll show you what that looks like in another slide or so. But see, each amino acid here is colored uh, differently. Uh, and so, and that's true, it, it, I haven't really colored the amino acids in these so-called loops, but they would be rich in an amino acid typically like glycine, which has essentially no side chain on it, just a hydrogen atom. And here is an alpha helix with different amino acids. Okay, so that's just my own tiny construct of what a protein could look like. But now here are examples of real proteins. So here is hemoglobin on the left. So that is the your red blood cells are chock-a-block full of hemoglobin, and it is an oxygen-carrying molecule. So these red heme groups are shown inside of all these alpha helices that, that form each of the subunits of hemoglobin. So there are four subunits in a hemoglobin molecule, and each of them is carrying an oxygen through one of these heme groups. You can't see the oxygen in this particular uh, image, but uh, there's two so-called alpha subunits and two so-called beta subunits, but they're actually fairly similar to each other. Okay, here's a picture of hair composed of keratin. Once again, alpha helices play a prominent role in this structure. They're wound around each other to make, to make the hair. Now here's a transporter, um, solved a structure solved by a good friend of mine several years ago, for which he received a Nobel Prize. So here you see a potassium channel, and you can see the potassium is actually in this channel. So this is called a selectivity filter that specifically recognizes potassiums and no other ions, and allows them to go through that filter. And here are these long helices, alpha helices, they're sort of the, the backbone structure of the channel. They're crossing the membrane of a cell, which I haven't shown you here, but they, they cross at the level of the selectivity filter. Now, I've been talking about all these alpha helical structures. There are lots of structures that are rich in those beta strands that I showed you a second ago. So here's one of a protein that's like that, called transthyretin. It carries thyroid hormone in our blood, and it has a whole bunch of central beta sheets. And it binds hormone, if I remember correctly, at, at either end here. You can bind at least two molecules at the flanks of the subunits. Okay, but the question we really wanted to come to was how do proteins fold? So if they start out as like a strand of amino acids, like a piece of spaghetti produced at the ribosome, how do they reach their three-dimensional structure? Well, I'm going to show you probably the single most important experiment that's ever been done in protein folding, carried out by a man named Christian Amphitson in the late 1950s. He received a Nobel Prize for this work in 1972. So what he showed was that that amino acid sequence in the protein contains all of the information that's necessary for the protein to be able to fold into its three-dimensional structure. So how did, he, how did he prove this? Well, first he had the idea in mind, I want to ask this question. If I take a purified protein 
and I completely unfold it by putting it into some chemical denaturants that make it come apart and go back to being a strand of spaghetti. Can it find its way back to the folded form all by itself? Is there enough information in the strand of spaghetti to make the protein fold into its active form? So he took this enzyme called ribonuclease. So we were talking about RNA a few slides ago. This is a, a small enzyme that actually makes RNA digest. It just cuts it into little pieces. So it's easy to assay it. So he took this protein. It has some bonds called disulfide bonds where two sulfurs come together and make a covalent bond. And he broke it apart. He, he completely unfolded the protein by using the chemical denaturant called urea. And he used what's called a reductant that breaks these disulfide bonds. And now he had essentially just a piece of spaghetti again. So here's ribonuclease spaghetti in this middle uh, panel here. Then he said, OK, I'm going to take away the urea and the mercaptoethanol and these things that are making the spaghetti. And so he put them in a dialysis bag. So dialysis bag is a place where your protein sits on the inside and the ions and small molecules just go through little tiny holes in the, the, the cellophane wall, as it were, out into a big buffer. And so as he did that, remarkably, the ribonuclease refolded and became enzymatically active. <coughs> So this is an absolutely astonishing result. Um, and actually, when I was an undergrad at, at Brown in 1972, when he won the prize, I had never heard about this experiment. But it was in the newspapers on the front page. And everybody in our fat cell lab went, oh my god, that is unbelievable. We have to see what proteins we have in the lab. And let's see if we can do that experiment. And so for just days and days, we were just talking about this unbelievable experiment of antigen cells. So I never thought I would ever have anything to do with anything that beautiful. I mean, it's just spectacular that you could do this. So um, let me give you a little more background, and then I'll tell you about the experiments that, that we've done. So there are conditions that you can subject an already folded protein to that make it become misfolded and aggregated. So it, remember I said there, there's a three-dimensional fold that's the native state. You can make the protein leave that native state by heating it up. So a good example is an egg. So it, when you look at the white of an egg, it's clear when you break the egg into the pan. And here's the major protein that's in that white part of the egg. It's called ovalbumin. And it, you can see it has a very complicated fold. <coughs> a lot of beta strands in it, some alpha helix, and it's very ordered, uh, and it's structural. And what happens when you heat it, I can't show you because we don't know the structure, but it becomes aggregate, it becomes a big mess. Everything is unfolded and sticking to everything else between molecules. So this ovalbumin on the left would be stuck to another three or four of them, in all of them in an unfolded spaghetti-like state. And so that's called aggregation. So the white of an egg is really an aggregate of protein, and the principal protein in that aggregate is ovalbumin. OK, so heat is a stress that causes proteins to become unfolded, misfolded, and aggregated. And the same thing happens inside cells. So if you took a bacterial <coughs> cell, so now we're looking at a little electron micrograph here, and you heat shock the cell, so let's say it was growing at 25 degrees or 30 degrees centigrade, but room temperature, let's say. And now you take it up to like our body temperature or something like that. That's a heat shock for that cell. And here are the aggregates that always go to the terminal end of the cell. So this is all sorts of aggregated protein of that bacterial cell. It's not a single protein like ovalbumin. It's a lot of different proteins all glommed together in a misfolded and inactive state. So that's an aggregate. And the, the bacterium tries to stay alive by putting this stuff out to the end of the cell. Um, here's where its DNA is. It keeps it away from its nucleus where its DNA is. OK, so what about misfolding and aggregation? It's bad for the cell um, in, in two major ways. One is proteins that have to get to a functional form or maintain a functional form lose it because they've become unfolded and they no longer have that three-dimensional structure that's active. They're just aggregated and dysfunctional. 
Okay, and aggregates can be toxic. So now we, we're talking about a medical side of this. So uh, people who have sickle cell anemia have a hemoglobin, which you, you saw that in Living Color a few slides ago. They have a hemoglobin that has a mutation in it that causes the globin chains to misfold and aggregate inside of the red cells. And they make really sharp edges that actually cause the red cells to break. And so that's why it's an anemia, is because all those red cells are gone. They're, they're constantly breaking. Okay, a second example is <clears throat> in Alzheimer's disease, a neurodegenerative condition that um, unfortunately people beyond, for example, 80 years of age have almost a 50% chance of having. There are aggregates that form inside the brain, and they're toxic to it in ways that we don't fully understand at this point. They're typically outside of cells, uh, between neurons, but they are toxic to the central nervous system. Well, there's even worse news, actually, to tell you. Uh, and that is that misfolding and aggregation are going on all the time in normal cells, in you and me, all the time. So a good percentage of all the proteins that we make are misfolding and aggregating all the time. So it's not like the Amphenson experiment where all the ribonuclease molecules went nicely down the ski slope to the lodge that was the native state, the fully folded active structure. In the case of the cell, many proteins, while they're getting made, get lost on their way down the ski slope. So they get into a local minimum. So you, you, as I do all the time when I go skiing, and I, every, all my kids laugh at me. They say, Dad, you're stuck. Do we have to come and pull you out of there? So the, the protein can't get down the slope. It's stuck in a local uh, area, a local energetic minimum, where it's misfolded. And that's where it's at risk for aggregating. And so um, the idea is, does Mother Nature have a defense against this? Is there a way to prevent misfolding and aggregation? And the answer is yes. Mother Nature doesn't leave anything to chance. How was this discovered and how does it work? How does a machinery that prevents proteins from misfolding in the cell actually work? Okay, so now just a little background and then we're coming up to some of our own work. So in the 1970s, there, I just told you about heat stress uh, and, and what it does to an egg, for example. In the 1970s, people were heating up cells and observing that there, there are specialized proteins inside the cell that become very abundant under heat shock conditions. And these were called heat shock proteins. So here you see a cell at a normal temperature, and now it's at, at a heat shock temperature. All the, these are identical lanes, more or less. But here you see that there are two size proteins, heat shock protein 90, which is a 90,000 Dalton protein, called here P95, and heat shock protein 70 of 70,000 Daltons, called P76, and they're heat shock proteins that are induced when the, when the cell is exposed to a stress like heat shock. And here's a small heat shock protein that's smaller, runs further on this so-called uh, electrophoresis gel. Okay. Well, people saw that there were these heat shock proteins, but they said, well, you know, they obviously correlate with protecting the cell, but how do they work? Do they affect glucose metabolism? Do they protect DNA and RNA under heat shock conditions? Do they protect membranes? What do they do? And so nobody had any really good idea about this. There are a lot of different hypotheses. And then working in, the, in, um, in England, Hugh Pelham uh, in 1984 made a really major suggestion that heat shock proteins are actually protecting other proteins during heat stress. So in other words, the heat shock protein is preventing the white of the egg from going from clear to white. It's actually able to maintain it in a clear state. And so at the cellular level, what he did was to overexpress HSP70, and he noticed that heat shock cells, the nucleus of heat shock cells, start to look funny under heat shock conditions. But if you overexpressed HSP70, it was normal. The nucleus seemed to be normal. It recovered very rapidly from the heat shock and went on to function normally. 
And so here was his molecular model based on some experiments that I won't review that were really brilliantly conceived. So here is an HSP70. We're now talking about a protein itself, a specialized protein that is a molecular crowbar. So the idea is HSP70 binds to incipiently aggregating proteins. These are two proteins that shouldn't stick together under normal conditions, but under heat stress, they're starting to stick to each other. And what happens is when HSP70 binds to these guys, it through the offices of burning up ATP, hydrolyzing the energy currency, ATP to ADP, it, there's a crowbar action that actually separates these two proteins from each other. And the idea is that HSP70 would cycle back and forth. So these were the first intuitions about how what we call chaperones work. So a lot of people in the room don't know what a molecular chaperone is, but the idea is in the Victorian era, in the late 1800s, when you went on, out on a date with somebody of the opposite sex, you always had to go out with a chaperone who would keep the two of you from having illicit interactions with each other during your date. Okay, and that's what these guys are doing. They're preventing proteins from having illicit interactions. That's the idea of molecular chaperones, to prevent those interactions that we call aggregation from occurring by actually binding to a protein and preventing it from aggregating. Okay, so now we come to Yale. So it's 1987, so this is some years after Pelham's initial experiment, and people are in agreement across the field that under heat shock conditions, there are these proteins induced, they seem to prevent aggregation. So we're working in a yeast system, a uh, simple baker's yeast, you can have lots of cells in a culture, and, you can, and they have only one copy of every gene, so it makes it easier than working with two copies as we all have. Uh, so you can work with mutant yeast and learn lots of things. <clears throat> so it's late one night in the lab while we're studying a system that I'll describe in just a second. And we say, huh, under normal conditions, do you think you need molecular chaperones? Not just stressful conditions, but normal conditions. And is there such a thing as a protein folding machine? In other words, it sees the newly made piece of spaghetti and it actually folds the spaghetti into that native three-dimensional proper structure that's active. <clears throat> okay, so here's the system we were working on at that point. So we were studying how proteins that, are, that make up mitochondria actually get to mitochondria. So let me just go slow for a second. So most of the proteins of mitochondria are actually encoded in the nucleus, in our DNA. Uh, the mitochondria themselves have a little snippet of DNA to make a few things. But most of the proteins are actually encoded by the nucleus. And so they're actually made on ribosomes. We talked about translation on ribosomes in Tom Stites' beautiful work. And so the proteins are made on ribosomes, but they have a little ticket, a little signal at the front end that says, take me to mitochondria. I'm not going to live in the cytosol. And so this signal gets recognized by a receptor system in the mitochondrial membranes, and then the protein goes into mitochondria. So it's a zip code, as it were. Okay, now we knew from some, some experiments that had been carried out the preceding year that for proteins to actually pass through the mitochondrial membranes, they have to be completely unfolded. So they have to be a strand of spaghetti to go through the mitochondrial membrane. So it's just like coming off the ribosome. Spaghetti, or you can't go through the membrane. Okay, now what happens on the other side of the membranes? So this is what everybody believed after the Anfinson experiment, that proteins go through the membranes, and now they fold spontaneously, and now you have the biological function, whatever it is. And so but what we suggested was, huh, could there be a machine on the other side of the mitochondrial membranes that actually assists or mediates the folding and without it, nothing folds correctly, okay? If that's true, then if we have a mutation that affects that machine, then nothing will fold correctly. Proteins will be imported into the mitochondria, and then they'll just be biologically dead, and they'll probably aggregate. 
And that is exactly what we found within a couple weeks of having this idea. So I think that the take home is no idea is ridiculous until you test it. And we kept testing this over and over again and on a lot of different proteins and found that, aha, we've actually found a mutant that affects the folding of newly imported proteins reaching, so now this is a diagram of the inside of mitochondria. So here are proteins that we tested. I, I won't go through them. This was our original reporter protein. Uh, here are some other ones. But all of them went into the organelles and then they failed to fold. And we could rescue the, the cells. The, the cells died immediately. Within 45 minutes, they were dead. So we could rescue the cells with a gene that encoded what, was, what we called a heat shock protein of 60,000 Daltons, HSP60 for short. So this was a protein that somebody else had observed, a man named Richard Hallberg, had observed a year ahead of time, was a mildly heat-inducible protein inside mitochondria, but a very abundant protein. And he also had done electron microscopy on it and shown that it was a ring assembly. And so this ring structure we now could relate to the folding of proteins entering mitochondria. Okay. Here's just some of the principles of that work. Ming Cheng was my first graduate student at Yale. Uh, she was a young physician who came from Taiwan. And so she pulled up this mutant, and I said, Ming, that's incredible. We, but I, I don't believe it, and nobody else is going to believe this. I mean, you're contravening uh, something that's been around for 25, 30 years now, namely that proteins fold spontaneously in living cells. And you're showing that they don't. Uh, and here is Kirsten Bragg, who joined the lab shortly after, and she's responsible for, for what I'm going to show you in a few minutes of the first x-ray structure of one of these machines. Um, and here is Ulrich Hartle uh, and his wife Monajit, uh, who contributed considerably to the biochemistry of the experiment that I showed you. Because we had a hard time believing our own results. We were afraid of our own results. And we went to and were called by one of the major mitochondrial labs in the world in Munich, of which Ulrich was one of the senior members working under a man named Walter Neupert, who was the big boss, the Oberg boss. Uh, and, and Ulrich knew what we were doing. And he said, uh, we, want, we want to help you guys work this out. Uh, we have a hard time believing this also, but let's do some more biochemistry. And so our groups worked together for several years before we finally published on this, when we were absolutely sure that it was clear that this was a folding machine inside mitochondria. OK, so now I'm going to fast forward a little bit. So it turns out that here is the component that we studied called heat shock protein 60 in mitochondria. Well, you know, mitochondria in evolution are descended essentially from events that relate to one bacterial cell eating another cell. And you know, one of the cells became mitochondria inside the other one. So bacteria, it turned out, have a relative to HSP60 called GROW-EL. Uh, GROW just means growth. E meant a phage protein that is very important, requires this uh, machine in order to make uh, phage particles. This is of some historical significance, but I won't dwell on it. And L is for large. It's a large subunit. And then the third leg of this triangle was inside plants. There are small organelles called chloroplasts that are involved with CO2 fixation, as you know. And there, there was another protein that was another double ring assembly that was shown to be involved with assembly of the CO2 fixing enzyme called resistance. OK, so these are three chaperones in an evolutionarily related group. And then Jonathan Trent, who was a postdoc in my group, um, discovered a second family of these relating a um, archibacterial, that's another kingdom of life in addition to bacteria, an archibacterial double ring to protein folding inside of archibacteria. And then remarkably, he found a relationship to one of these things inside of our own cells in the cytosol called T-complex polypeptide 1, or chaperonin containing um, uh, polypeptide 1. As you can see, this double ring assembly has different subunits in each one. OK. Now, all of these carry out protein folding, just like HSP60 did. 
Okay, so how do any of these things work? So the next thing that was done was um, a, an experiment carried out by George Lorimer and his co-workers at DuPont. They reconstituted a folding reaction by one of these ring assemblies in a test tube, in a two-step reaction. So in the first step, they took bacterial broyel and they took a protein um, that was uh, Rubisco, one of the most abundant enzymes in the biosphere, unfolded it in urea, just like I did in the original Amphenson experiment, and said, what happens when I uh, incubate this unfolded protein with this Groyel double ring? What happens is you get a what's called a stoichiometric one-to-one -one complex of the unfolded protein bound to this double ring inside the central hole of the ring. Then in a second step, they added a little lid structure that shares the coating region with Groyel and bacteria called Groe small, Groe s. And so all of these are seven member rings. So there's seven of these in each ring here. And this is a seven member ring that can make one to one contacts with this ring. And so when you add Groe s and magnesium ATP, voila. Over the space of a couple minutes, native rubisco, fully folded and correctly folded, is released from this system. So this is the whole folding reaction. But how does it work? What, I mean, what goes on? I mean, is it some sort of magic, or what goes on? What's this binding reaction all about? If you don't have Groel here, this protein will just aggregate. And that's true for most proteins. They would just aggregate. So Groel somehow captures them and prevents them from misfolding. They're held in a state where they're not biologically active yet, but they're stabilized against aggregation. And now in the second step of this reaction, GROES binds as a lid over this polypeptide bound ring, and now the protein is folded. Okay, so how does the machine work? By 1991, there were about uh, 20 different models for how it might work. Almost as many different models as there were investigators working on. So that's when an accident happened where I got to meet uh, Paul Sigler, who had just come to Yale from the University of Chicago and was working over in the Gibbs building right across the way from where we are here. And so Paul had just solved a major structure of, of DNA binding protein bound to DNA. And here he is with key members of his team, um, Andre Ohimiak and Spishak Otwanowski. And so I... I, this was an accident. They, the School of Medicine said, you have to go over and talk to Paul Sigler about an administrative matter. Just take care of it. You've got to just go do it. So I walk into Sigler's office and he says, this is ridiculous. We don't have to talk about this administrative nonsense. It's taken care of. Forget about it. It's just done. But I want to talk about what you guys are doing with these ring assemblies. You're never going to figure out how they work unless you get a crystal structure at high resolution of this machine. Then you'll be able to generate a model for how it really works. And so he drags Spishak into the room. Spishak looks at how big this thing is, and he says, I'm sorry, but there's no computing on Earth right now that can handle this kind of problem. But I'm not worried, because it's going to take you guys a couple of years to generate a good crystal of this molecule, and by then we'll have computers that can handle this. So, OK. He was right. It took us several years to crystallize this. We tried a lot of things, and I won't detail that. But eventually, Kirsten Bray, my student that you saw a picture of, pulled this beautiful crystal out of a drop. She had like a wall of trays, each one with like 50 wells or 48 wells in it, with a crystallization buffer in it. And from this wall of trays, she found this drop with this beautiful crystal in it. And we took that and diffracted that in x-rays. And, and Spishek, was, he was right. He was ready with computing and with his own program for how to solve the structure of this complicated double ring machine. And so here you see it in the flesh, you know, at high resolution, um, the determined uh, model from the x-ray structure. And so Groyel is essentially composed of two back-to-back -back rings. And so each ring has seven subunits. But each subunit is folded into three different domains. So remember, hemoglobin had four subunits. You, 
here, there, these are domains within a subunit, as it were. So here, it's seven subunits per ring, and each subunit has three domains. So these equatorial domains make the waistline of this machine. And they're the base that holds the machine together. And the intermediate domain is a hinge. And the apical domains are attached at the end of the, the uh, terminal ends of the intermediate domains. So these apical domains are the business end of their machine because on their inside aspect, as I'll show you in just a second, is a hydrophobic surface, a greasy surface that can specifically recognize proteins that are misfolded. It has no affinity for normal folded protein, even though it might float into the hole and float back out. It just sees misfolded proteins and binds them. And so um, here, What's the scale? Here may be a question that a few people have, so I just want to diverge for one second. How big is a Groyel double ring? Okay, here's a bacterial cell in the transmission electron microscope. It's magnified 20,000 times. So normally, you can only see a bacterial cell at roughly 40x magnification in a regular microscope. In the electron microscope, you, can, you get good magnification. Here is what a grow yell would look like inside the cell if it were magnified 10 times over normal. So if you drop the size of this by tenfold, you no longer could see it. But yet there are thousands of grow yell molecules floating around inside a bacterial cell ready to bind and fold proteins. Um, they're almost as abundant as the ribosomes off of which proteins are, are made. Okay, here's the polypeptide binding surface of a Groyel ring. So if you were standing in the top ring of the double ring and looking at the back wall, this is what you would see. You would see all these residues, and I'll just say that these amino acids have a side chain that is greasy, it is hydrophobic, and they're pointing directly into the cavity of the ring. So they're there to bind a misfolded or not native polypeptide and capture it. So some years later, we were able to actually see a protein that's unfolded while it's bound to grow EL. So here's that protein called malate dehydrogenase. It's an enzyme. And here's its subunit captured by three of those so-called apical domains of grow EL. And so here you see the blue is the MDH right in the middle of the cavity, touching three or four of these apical domains. So they're binding it through these hydrophobic interactions. Now let me emphasize this hydrophobicity, because this, this is the principle to all molecular chaperones. That I'm talking about ring assemblies, but there are other types of chaperones that have different geometries for binding misfolded or non-native proteins. So in a normal folded protein, all the greasy stuff, all those leucines and isoleucines and greasy side chains are buried to the inside of the protein. They make a hydrophobic core to the protein. So hydrophobic core is a water-hating kind of thing. It, it wants to bury itself and stay away from water. It's, it's energetically unfavorable for that stuff to be exposed to water. But under conditions of stress uh, or in the cell, when a protein is in the process of folding, that hydrophobic core can become exposed at the surface of a protein. And now, these greasy surfaces, like in the egg, under heat, stick together and you get aggregation. And so that's a dysfunctional protein that could lead to disease. So in Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, there are characteristic proteins that aggregate. And that some of them do that through a hydrophobic core. So what's the idea of the chaperonin? It has its own hydrophobic binding surface surrounding the protein and that prevents the protein from aggregating. It's, it, it, here's, its, here's the protein's exposed hydrophobic surfaces. Well, the chaperonin has its own hydrophobic surfaces, namely seven of them around a ring, and that just binds the polypeptide and occupies those surfaces so that they can't go on to aggregate. Okay, now I want to talk about folding, because the second part of that reaction, as you remember from the George Lorimer experiment, is the part where you add ATP and that lid structure, and now the protein actually folds and is then released from the machine. Okay, so 
Helen Stable was key to this work. So she is a collaborator of ours. Um, this is a rare sunny day in London where she's sitting out in her backyard in the garden reading something interesting, I hope. Um, so when we first looked at the Groel structure and imposed on it a, even a folded protein of one of our favorite proteins to work on uh, called Rodenese, the protein rammed into the apical domains. There, there's a terrible problem here. The protein really can't fit in the open cavity of a ring, even in its fully folded state. So how could it fold in there? But then Helen changed our thinking on the time scale of a month or two when she showed us these photos. So these are electron microscopic images of Groyel. Here you see one ring on top. Here's the lower ring. And this ring on top has that lid, that little lid structure called Groyes, bound to it. And look what happened. Now there's a big space underneath Groyes in the Groyel cavity. Suddenly we're thinking, whoa, a protein might be able to fit in there and maybe even fold in there in a sequestered environment underneath Groyes. And so um, Jonathan Weissman, son of Sherman Weissman in genetics here, who was a postdoc in my lab at that point, is now a famous investigator at UC San Francisco doing beautiful work in a whole variety of areas. But when he was a postdoc, he carried out this very nice experiment that made it clear that a protein could be housed inside of a ring underneath GROWES. So what he did was what we call an order of addition experiment. He added the non-native protein first, so here's NDH, or <clears throat> he could use Rodenese or whatever he wanted to use, and it binds to a ring. It's only one Groyel ring at a time. They, they don't bind to both at the same time. Okay, then he has the lid structure called Groyes. So the lid comes on randomly. It either comes on to the same ring as has this polypeptide, or it comes on to the opposite ring. And now he can interrogate which ring it actually came on to, by adding what a protease called protease K. So if it's open, if there's an open ring, as in this case, opposite that of, uh, occupied by GROES, the protein is completely digested away. But if, on the other hand, the polypeptide is in the same ring that GROES binds to, it's completely protected from the protease. So that means that the protein can be housed in this chamber inside of this machine. So does it fold in that space? So Wayne Fenton in my group, uh, I think Wayne, he was doing the demonstration out here for an hour or two. Uh, he looks like Santa Claus, so you may recognize him, or he may have dem demonstrated uh, the anti-aggregation properties of GROEL for you uh, in a test tube. So what he did was he took a protein, he diluted it straight into buffer, it aggregated like crazy, and you could see a cloudy solution, just like the egg. And then he diluted a protein into a mixture with GROEL, and the protein solution stayed completely clear because GROEL bound that protein and prevented it from aggregating. Okay, so he did this key experiment related to folding. He either started with what we call a trans complex, where GROES is bound to one ring and polypeptide to the opposite ring, or he made a cis complex where the polypeptide is underneath GROES inside of a GROEL ring, and then he added ATP and asked what happened. Which one of these was active? It turned out that this was the one that was active. This was the folding active version of GROEL. A polypeptide is housed underneath this lid, and it's released into the chamber, and it now folds in isolation where nothing can interfere with it, and then at the end of that, it's released into free solution. And in, in the case of OTC, the subunits assemble spontaneously to make the active form of the enzyme. Okay, so now we wanted to ask a further question. Can a protein not only start folding in that chamber, but go all the way to the folded active form inside that chamber? So the problem is that normally, the lid, GROES, binds and releases from GROEL roughly every 10 seconds. So it cycles with ATP binding and hydrolysis in a double ring context. But in a single ring context, the nucleotide cycle is blocked. So I, without detailing this, 
I just want to say that you form a stable, grow yes bound, single ring. And so we made that. The lid won't come off. It's stuck in this ATP state. And the protein could, in principle, fold in that chamber all the way to the native state. So the experiment was to start with this single ring, bind the protein. It's just shown as a line here because we don't have a structure for a piece of spaghetti. Bind rodents to that ring. Then add grow yes and ATP and make this folding chamber. OK, so this is a stable, large assembly, about 400,000 Daltons, quite large and separable in what we call gel filtration columns. And so we asked, OK, where is the rodent activity after this protein is refolded? Can it refold inside of this chamber? And we actually fractionate the whole chamber and show that the activity goes with the chamber. OK, so here on the top, it's just shown the recovery of rodent activity when we had grow yes and ATP. The recovery rate is the same as a, a normal grow yell double ring, and the same occurs at a, a single ring. And, but in the bottom here, what we've actually done at each time point, we've separated in this column the 400 KD complete complex and said, OK, is there any activity associated with it? And the answer is, yes, the kinetics of refolding is exactly the same as assaying the whole reaction mixture. So that says that folding inside of this chamber goes all the way to the folded enzymatically active form. And that enzyme is active while it's spinning around inside this chamber. So the chamber supports folding to the native state. OK, so what does the folding chamber actually look like? So in further x-ray studies with um, uh, postdoc and Paul Sigler's lab, particularly Zhao Wei Zhu was the major mover here, um, we produced crystals of grow yes bound to grow yell. And so what you see is this grow yell ring looks like just a standard unoccupied grow yell ring. But this one that has grow yes bound to it has undergone major changes in conformation. And here's what's happened. It's best uh, thought about as if you were looking at an excavator. So an excavator has an equatorial domain that has the engine and ATP in it and generates energy. And then there are two hinge structures here that are like the intermediate domain of grow yell here. So things can happen around the hinges. And here's the working part, the apical domains as they were. So here's that hydrophobic surface. So here's what happens in reality. You start with unlike handed grow yell. So this subunit is color, color, it has been colored. And these two helices, H and I, are the polypeptide binding greasy surface. When grow yes binds, as illustrated here, here you see the top hat on top of a grow yell ring, now the whole subunit and that whole ring of the machine undergoes this huge conformational change that's symbolized down here. The apical domains elevate 60 degrees and they go 90 degrees clockwise. So all that hydrophobic surface that was involved originally with binding a polypeptide is facing us out of the board. And there's a completely new lining to the cavity that is now, as I'll show you in the next slide, is hydrophilic in character. It's water loving. It's electrostatic. It's not hydrophobic. It's just the opposite. So here's, uh, here's the chamber that's formed. You can see grow yes bound on top here. Here's this little chamber, about 70 angstroms in width and in height. And a polypeptide folds in isolation in this space where it simply cannot aggregate with anything else. It's in solitary confinement. Here's what the wall character did. All this yellow was the original hydrophobicity of an open ring. That's all been converted to hydrophilic electrostatic character shown by all this blue. So, the, so all, of the, all of this hydrophobicity has now moved sideways to make contacts between the subunits in the wall. And the actual cavity lining is completely changed to a hydrophilic character. And that would favor that the polypeptide has to bury its own hydrophobic surface. It's been ejected from the cavity wall into this space where it starts to fold on its own according to Anfinson's principles. It, it's simply following its way down the ski slope without the chance of aggregating to anything else because there's nothing else in there. 
Okay, so I'm going to finish now. So it's ATP binding and hydrolysis, actually, that drives this reaction cycle. So I've showed you various states. And the way the machine goes between those states is by using ATP as a trigger, as it were, and ATP hydrolysis as a, as a second type of trigger. So here is the activation of folding. That occurs when seven ATPs bind to this particular ring. And through work of Amnon Horowitz at the Weissman Institute in Israel, no relative, but we're very close friends and tennis buddies, um, it's been shown that this ATP binds cooperatively. So when one ATP binds, that favors that six more are going to bind, and all of the sites in that ring will be full of ATP. But with respect to the opposite ring, there's anti-cooperativity. This ring is completely unoccupied and disfavored to bind any nucleotide when ATP is bound to this top ring. OK, so ATP binding moves this ring in such a way that polypeptide can bind in an ordered way, followed by grow yes. And now you have injection of the polypeptide into the folding chamber. So this is the business end of this reaction. I'm going to show you a movie of it in just a second that takes about 10, that runs for about 10 seconds. And the machine really doesn't care whether a polypeptide is there or not. It can run on a, an infinite cycle as long as there's ATP there. OK, at the end of, eight, of 10 seconds, ATP hydrolyzes to make ADP. And now, that gates entry of everything into the opposite ring. So ATP gets there, polypeptide gets there, and then grow yes gets there. And now that ring becomes folding active. But at the same time that ATP and polypeptide bind here, they send what we call an allosteric signal from, from this ring to this ring that is an ejection notice. It says, goodbye, grow yes, goodbye, polypeptide, goodbye, ADP. And they all leave and go out into solution. Now you're going to look down at the barrel of a ring, and you see all this yellow surface. So that is the hydrophobic binding surface right here in the center. Okay. And you're now going to see the ring from the side. And the first thing that happens is ATP binds in the seven sites of a ring. And now you see the apical domains. They're opening and going counterclockwise. And at the same time, this is a protein that we've computationally unfolded. It becomes bound to the hydrophobic sequences. And now grow ES comes in. And now you see a huge, that huge rigid body movement. Elevation, counterclockwise twist. And the polypeptide is released into the cavity. So it has 10 seconds of folding that go on, roughly, at the end of which ATP hydrolysis occurs. Here's free phosphate coming out, and now ATP can enter the opposite ring. And that's the ejection notice. So things are going to start to leave this ring, and simultaneously additional ligands bind to this ring. So now it becomes folding active, and you'll see the blue blinking light, which we believe is just following Anthonson's principles. Polypeptides ejected into that cavity, and it finds its way down the energy landscape. OK, so that was a slow motion. Now, this is what the reaction is like in real time. So you'll see that a ring spends almost all of its time in the folding active state. And then the transition between the two rings is only about a second or so. So all hell breaks loose, as is going to happen right here. OK, so you, so you can see things leave one ring, they come on the other ring. So the, so the machine spends most of its time in a folding active state. So the duty cycle of the machine is greater than like 90% of the time. So Groyel is very active all of the time. The transitions are very fast. OK, so let's see. I'm off into La La Land here since I left where I was. Let me see if I can do it. So let me just acknowledge a few people. Um, so Ming and Ulrich were crucial to the early discovery work. Um, a lot of people have participated in structural work, but Kirsten grew the amazing crystals that were just magical. Spishek solved that initial structure. Zhao Wei, the uh, growing S structure. Helen, our EM experiments. Paul passed away in the year 2000. We really missed him. He had an idea every 20 seconds. I mean, he was a he was called a human dynamo when he was eulogized by really one of the greatest crystallographers of all time, Max Perus. Um, 
On mechanism, a whole group of people, including Wayne, who was here earlier this morning, have uh, participated in working out the dance of our reaction cycle. I'll just say that more, more recently we're working on ALS, which has a misfolding uh, component to uh, several uh, versions of ALS uh, using a mouse model. We're hopeful that maybe we'll be able to come up with something for that. So I thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions either about the science or about you know what life is like doing science. So thanks so much.